Okay, and I will move on to our final presentation of the panel before moving to the questions uh, by Yorgos Venizelos. So, thank you. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting uh, some stuff from my PhD uh, research, which was uh, defended a few months ago. Uh, similar data, but I'm using it to draw on uh, some different uh, sorts of uh, uh, questions. And um, again, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm using uh, similar theories of, uh, of discourse and performativity as, as, as previous uh, uh, presenters to address certain, um, uh, let's say, paradoxes when it comes to supporting uh, political actors against, let's say, a background of uh, facts. Um, so uh, we heard many experts and uh, uh, journalists and so on uh, wondering why would someone vote for uh, someone uh, as crazy as Donald Trump? Um, that was in two, 2016. And here's a, a very nice uh, quote from uh, Ari Rachel uh, Hochschild and uh, the Great Paradox, um, and uh, she was uh, she 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 identified this paradox where Tea Party advocates um, who work in uh, and run small businesses they support and bug laws that basically are against their own interests, as uh, small farmers voting for Monsanto, corner drugstore owners voting for Walmart, local bookstore owners vo voting with Amazon. Uh, but then it did happen, and uh, Trump. Uh, uh, won the election. Um, and then we go in uh, 2020 elections and uh, we are again confronted with the same sort of uh, uh, paradox. Uh, his style, his politically incorrect character, uh, his failure to implement key promises, the whole like uh, COVID uh, management and so on. Um, and uh, experts were so sure that he was going to win, but then we saw that he even got 10 million votes more than in uh, 2016. The, his, his own party, which was not supporting him in, uh, in uh, 2016, uh, got really uh, behind his back uh, four years later. And uh, the idea here, like what I, what I want to address is basically, uh, I want to go be beyond rationalist accounts and by rationalist, okay, I don't want to identify anyone specifically in the literature, but let's say broadly speaking, accounts that stress that the role of partisan identity only, uh, or uh, being a good government or consistent in what you say and what you do is uh, sufficient for uh, winning elections. And uh, to do that, I'm, I'm drawing on, uh, on, uh, on some tools from uh, populism studies and not only. And uh, basically, we all know that populism is about people centrism and anti elitism in terms of the operational criteria. But what does this really mean? Um, and then I draw on on many theories like Leclerc, Sigi, Moffitt, uh, and also Weber and Galivas to uh, get into the flesh of what discourses or what people centrism and, and, and anti elitism is and uh, obviously it's not just rhetoric but it's it's a sort of uh, it's a habit it's a way of, of behaving of performing of, uh, of of being someone that people uh, can uh, connect with and uh, I think that some of these concepts and uh, theories here are very in line with uh, people centrism and anti-elitism, the two criteria. For example, Ostig is uh, high and low. So uh, if you are low, basically you are sort of behaving in a popular way. Okay, that's different from populist, but we can discuss it later. But the important thing here is that you're opposing the high, the elitist, the technocratic, the anti-populist. And uh, this has to do not just with discourse saying or like rhetoric saying I hate the establishment but it's certain uh, bodily gestures, demand or language, social markers as uh, Ostigi says or as uh, Maria Casulo says 
um, uh, some bodily choreographies. Um, uh, and this is very evident in Trump, but we'll see later, or as Moffitt says, but manners. And this idea of, of transgression that is present in Laclau and Ostigui and uh, very much in Weber and also recently Theo, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a very, very important notion that can be connected with the high and low because when populist actors are, are transgressing the, uh, the high, they basically violate certain social, cultural or political norms that are thought to be uh, uh, the standard, the, the hegemonic, the, the proper. And uh, by doing so, they're, they're putting into question certain moral and symbolic authorities. This can be political uh, parties and uh, ideologies, very strictly speaking, but it can also be something more general as we observe you know, after the 2008 uh, crisis and the rise of populism, um, basically questioning many different uh, aspects of, of, of everyday life, of waves of, of, of being. And obviously this sort of, transgression and antagonism towards uh, the established um, ideas, uh, as Canovan uh, uh, said it, of a, established ideas of, of a given era, uh, they're not just about dismantling uh, hegemon the hegemony, let's say, but it's also by, about um, creating a new one, uh, articulating a new project and um, uh, in Schumpeter's term, let's say it's like a, a creative uh, uh, destruction. Uh, so, okay, the PhD draw on, drew on many, many data, uh, speeches, videos, uh, and so on. I use discourse analysis and visual analysis to see all these kind of theories and the ways of behaving and so on. And um, I also interviewed um, Trump supporters uh, in the States, uh, went to some uh, evangelical church meetings, uh, some gunshots and stuff, and I tried to uh, understand what the fuck was happening. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, the first two, let's say, methods uh, are focused on the way uh, Trump spoke. And uh, the second two, uh, were meant to investigate how uh, this style resonated with the people, uh, how, in what ways they justify all these paradoxes and, in, and inconsistencies. And um, okay, I'm trying to turn this into a paper now so the data may be a little different. And I don't know what I'm presenting today, something in between uh, the, um, one of the PhD cases and the, and the paper. And um, yeah, like very briefly with some pictures, because we all know the story. Uh, if you observe, uh, if, you, if you take a look at a video of Donald Trump talking, he has all these weird um, hand gestures, awkward mannerisms, um, he's provocative, incorrect, vulgar, abrasive. Uh, his language is very poor, as some um, linguists uh, said. And uh, journalists also said, like, he's ignorant. That's you. We should not vote for this guy, right? He's stupid. But of course, we have to think, like, who is saying that? Uh, elitist uh, sort of experts. But, anyways, the important thing here is that these features, which we can sort of examine through the lens of uh, exceptionality or, uh, or uh, charismatic politics, are basically not uh, a conventional way of, uh, of, of doing politics, of, of performing as a political uh, actor. So in this sense, we could say that is, uh, Trump's style was transgressive to the um, main values of, uh, or main norms of politics and culture in the, in the USA. And I give some, <laughs> These are real. Like I was wondering if, if uh, initially when I started following all the uh, Trump accounts and Facebook and Twitter and stuff, if that was a troll account, but it was his real account, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of shocking, uh, <laughs> but very entertaining in a way. And that's an important word, I think, entertaining. Um, so here he's, he's, self, he's self presented as, as a fighter, 
uh, I guess, uh, uh, in his battle against the establishment. And in the other one was after the 2019, I'm not sure of the, anyways, one of the uh, State of the Union speeches where uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, teared apart the, his speech. And then, uh, and then Trump posted this picture. These people around are all these, um, uh, are people who he invited as special guests. And uh, among all these special guests were not just uh, famous um, radical right, Fox, whatever um, uh, broadcasters, like uh, journalists, but they were common people. So I remember watching the speech and then you have uh, a veteran, a, a mother with her son, father was lost in the war, um, a drug addict who found his way back to society. Um, yeah, I mean, all this, chain, like he was creating a chain of equivalences of the so-called marginalized people. And then the establishment basically is against them, uh, according to this um, uh, Instagram post. And we can discuss later a bit more about like why does someone like Trump present himself as an anti-establishment character and uh, and uh, if, if he's so rich and um, shiny. And then obviously there's so many more uh, occasions. Uh, for example, five minutes, okay. Um, like Trump eating his uh, KFC although it is uh, on a private plane and he's actually holding a spoon and a uh, fork and knife. <laughs> but um, anyways, this reminded me of, of what Ostegui says, a public display of private preferences. So again, according to this theory, uh, a politician should go out, uh, have um, a tie, behave well, but this guy is actually, I don't know, uh, eating like a common person. Uh, supposedly, and then that's the uh, on the uh, on the bottom right. It's um, a, a screenshot I took from a speech a rally he gave in um, somewhere in Colorado, I think. Uh, where the stage was was like that, uh, you know, like to resemble the whole environment. And these, um, I think, can be connected to the notion of uh, of authenticity. And um, now I'm going to start uh, talking uh, a bit about um, uh, like providing the, the perspective of, of the common people, uh, let's say, of let's say the, the Trump supporters I, I spoke to when I was in the, in the US. And in this slide, I'm going to be giving a little bit about the, um, the, the context. Before Trump came, came to power, they, they had some general feelings of of being abandoned and, um, and and so on. And these are some statements or ideas that they presented to me, that the two parties are a different side of the same coin. Washington is an old boys club that determine American destiny. And then some other people were like, we didn't ask for political correctness, which is a big debate in the US. Um, not now, but now it's uh, high. And no one asked us if we wanted this change. So this is the background against which Trump, uh, Trump emerged. Obviously, this is not the total picture, but an aspect of it. And then here, I present certain statements uh, that are real, and, um, and uh, they resonate very well with uh, these um, theories that I, I presented earlier. So uh, this guy, a young veteran, he was probably my age, in Arizona, um, uh, he said that um, this guy, Trump, breaks the rules. His style is about uh, freedom of doing what you want. Everyone deep inside wants to insult everyone at their leisure without any problem. This guy does that. And it's actually true, but we don't do it here because there's some sort of uh, norm, some symbolic values and so on. And then, and also this guy was, was, was telling me about how he was uh, raised um, uh, with certain expectations of how to behave, conservative family and so on and so forth. Then Trump comes and uh, basically he says, I am doing what you are not allowed to do, what you, you are not allowed to do all these years, but 
I'm giving you the right to do it because I am, I am, I am all over the media and and uh, potentially your president. <laughs> and uh, some other guy in Pennsylvania uh, found his style very refreshing. And by that he meant that if you're crook, he calls you uh, crooked. Uh, this doesn't very, very often. And it was just like a casual conversation, you know, like he's very honest, like if you're crook, you're, you're that, I call you that. Um, the next statement is about political correctness. Um, I don't want to disrespect anyone, but things like gender issues have become so exaggerated. If you address the wrong person in the wrong way, you can get in trouble. It, it can be career ending. Trump wants to end that. He doesn't believe in political correctness. He believes in freedom of speech. And uh, that's the, this last slide is kind of interesting because uh, their understanding of freedom of speech and democracy and all these kind of things was so subverted, let's say. Uh, for example, there was this um, uh, guy who uh, did not identify as straight, but then he was also evangelical, and then he had problems with the Democrats for wanting to um, uh, punish the church for, uh, I don't know, like they wanted to get some taxes out, I can't remember the case exactly, and he wanted to punish the church for being uh, something and something, but then he was like, yeah, but I am gay, but I am also evangelical, and maybe I may wanna marry one day and stuff, and then he thought that this whole idea was uh, against freedom of speech and so on. Another example is uh, about his style, um, uh, is that this interview he said, uh, Donald Trump is so popular, uh, Donald Trump is so popular because he's so alpha. Um, he interrupts everyone uh, and that was actually fine for him. And all these kind of ideas that were not understood by his supporters as problematic or uh, improper or incivil, but uh, signs of strength and honesty and, 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 and transparency. Yeah, so I think there is some room for um, uh, thought here um, as to what uh, uh, the, the role of, of, uh, of, of political style and performativity in constructing identities, but maybe uh, above all, um, the role political elites play in, in, in fueling such a mobilization uh, that can be on the on the radical right, of course, um, but not only. But the thing here is that political elites, I think, in the U.S. have failed twice, uh, both in 2016 and 2020, to uh, understand that their discourse and uh, and whole like arrogance was so uh, like basically fueling so much uh, reaction and uh, generating even more support for uh, Trump. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Jonas.